Hi, I'm Whitney Espick, the CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I hope you enjoy this digital production created for alumni and friends like you. So good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be able to present for this audience. I was saying the strange thing about being an academic is that students are always frozen in time. We, they leave in the summer, we come back in the fall, and somehow they're mysteriously the same age. They're always 18 to 22. <laughs> but I, especially since I've had children, have noticed that I'm aging, and it's, it's an interesting phenomenon. So it's delightful to see all of the gray hair in the room and to think about the wisdom that's represented here today. What I'd like to present is my work it's about climate change, but I think the way I want to frame this is more broadly thinking about what climate change means for sustainable economies. And so some of the work I'm presenting is coming from a book I produced in 2016 called The Cultures of Markets, The Political Economy of Climate Change. Um, and this was a broad comparative international study of emissions markets. So looking at the ways in which countries around the world and regions are addressing climate change, and that's primarily through the pricing of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas emissions. But moving on from that, my work, what I'm trying to do is look at more broadly how we think about the nature of valuation within economies, both social as well as economic. How do we value resources and how do we value um, other sorts of uh, metrics or symbols of well-being in different societies. And so some of that work has taken me to the Arctic region where I'm looking at climate adaptation. Um, and some of that work is here in, in, in the United States and southern Louisiana um, where I'm working with tribal communities on relocation. So to get started, I think this audience is probably fairly familiar with the subject matter, but in 2015, countries around the world signed the Paris Accord. And this was a new system of climate accountability because it introduced a system of pledge and review where each country makes an intended nationally determined contribution and then periodically review how they're performing on those contributions. It was also remarkable because 196 countries signed the agreement, including the United States. And some would argue it's maybe not as ambitious as it should be because it allows every country to make their own pledge and to review it themselves and to see how they're doing in terms of meeting their goals. But on the other hand, it is quite significant because for the first time it got a truly global, truly international response to climate change. And the vast majority of systems that are being developed in each of these countries revolve around pricing of one form or another. Uh, there's a really nice world um, World Bank Group report that comes out every year called The State and Trends of Carbon Pricing. This was the latest report in 2018 where they document 45 national and 25 subnational jurisdictions that are putting a price on carbon. And so there's still debate within the literature about the actual effect of this. I think as um, Professor Zuber discussed earlier, there's some studies even at MIT showing that climate change is slowing in certain regions and there's certainly some effect but it's difficult to gauge exactly what that is. I think more interestingly there's, interestingly, there's a kind of political question about this. Do all nation states agree that pricing is really the way in which we address climate change? And this is something that I've looked at in my own work. It's this idea that there are greenhouse gas emissions or externalities. These are environmental benefits or costs that are accrued from economic activities that are not accounted in an economic transaction. And so these can be both negative, carbon pollution is a great example, um, forestry degradation. They can also be positive, so we could think about the production of seafood, timber, pollination services, water filtration, flood bank attenuation. And what's fascinating about carbon markets is, is the idea that you can use price, you can use a market mechanism to regulate and to govern the production of positive externalities and to reduce the production of negative externalities. And so what I did with my book in 2016 is I interviewed market makers, more than 250, um, in the cases that I examined around the world. And I asked, in, in addition to other things, two questions about the advantages of pricing and then the disadvantages of pricing as a solution to climate change. And I coded the responses to those um, questions and came up with an analysis that presented 
um, a range of different positive attributes that most respondents identified, ranging from governance efficiencies. So pricing is a more efficient way to govern uh, climate change to things like the capability to actually reduce emissions. Interestingly, most participants didn't focus on the capacity to reduce emissions. They just assumed that the price automatically does that. And then in the disadvantages, there are a range of responses from the reliance on governance cohesion, that you have to have a government that's committed um, and that is, is responsive to other governments that are trying to do the same thing to the challenge of political uncertainty. As you swing, for example, in the United States from Democrat to Republican between elections, you can have a change in policy and that's detrimental to the creation of carbon markets. And then also there were things that I think um, Valerie, for example, raised in her presentation, the technical complexity of carbon pricing and the time required to translate. And these responses, as you can see, this is a correlation analysis um, here were particularly more prevalent in terms of concern in the Asian and Asia Pacific region than they were in the United States or in um, the European Union. And so I think more broadly, I mean, I don't want to go into too much detail here, but to show that there was at a macro scale a kind of difference that was demonstrated in the cor correlation analysis in the way in which different countries thought about the advantages and disadvantages of pricing with a broadly more positive view in the United States, Australia, and the European Union in the Western context. And here I think we can think about what markets mean in terms of governance more broadly within these countries and the cultural familiarity with that approach. And then a, a fairly more negative response um, in the red in the, the Asia Pacific region. So particularly in China, Japan, and Korea where there's an attempt to use market mechanisms to manage climate change, but less familiarity. And then the other thing that I think was really interesting was the predominance of responses about markets or about the prevalence of economics and the inability, one of the concerns is that there's an inability to price the intangible because you're trying to price an externality, which is a very abstract idea. And so I want to delve a little bit more into these responses and what was going on. And I think this speaks more broadly to what climate change means in an economic context. Um, this was a, a report that came out, or an opinion piece that came out by Paul Krugman a couple months ago, where he said, getting real about rural America, and basically made this argument that there are powerful forces behind the relative, and in some cases, absolute decline of rural America and nobody how, knows how to reverse those, those forces. So basically making an argument that the well-documented decline of rural America was inescapable, in, inevitable. And so I thought this was really interesting. I also thought it was interesting, this idea that there are powerful economic forces at work. And I think this very much relates to thinking about what's going on with climate change. It's also very much situated in an idea of sustainability. And so this concept, you know, in my work, we think of it as a triple bottom line or as, um, as one way to think of sustainability where you have economy, environment, and social goals and you try to balance them. Um, there's other, other sort of evolutions of the literature on sustainability, some saying weak sustainability is where you make sacrifices, you trade off between economic, social, and environmental priorities. And then strong sustainability is where you nest economic activity within the space of its social boundaries. So prioritize fit economic activity within the bounds of social priorities. And then nest social priorities within the bounds of the natural environment so that the resources that exist can support the social activities and the social activities can support the economic activities. And so I think ultimately what Krugman is describing is a lack of sustainability. And this very much, we can think about climate change as a failure to price externalities, but we can also think of it as an outcome, as a symptom of the incapability of our economies to work in a fashion of strong sustainability. And so what does this mean? One of the things that I've explored in my work is also the way in which we think about pricing and value. So I won't go too much detail into this graphic, but within economics, there's a premise that there are two basic forms of value, use and exchange value. 
And I argue that this is basically just a spatial distinction, whether his value is utilized in place or whether it's mobilized in place. What externality pricing forces us to do is to think about also the temporal distinction. What does value mean if you could distinguish it from value that's already been created versus value that's subject to conditions, value yet to be created? And so in my typology, there's at least two other forms of value. There's derived value, and we could think about this in the context of financial derivatives, very well demonstrated. But then there's also external value, externalities predicated on use, the capacity to sustain the use of resources across time. And this is where carbon pricing and derived from it environmental finance is, or at the least should be situated. And so if we think about value in this context, we have to then think about where, when, and how does value exist across space and time. And this requires a very deep thinking about the nature of resources and the connection of the economy to those resources. It also requires a thinking about the social, the economic, and the environmental distinction. So I haven't done this, but I sort of broadly thought about if you were to give green as a color for environment, red as a color of economy or economics, and blue a color of social, the ways in which you might prioritize or you might think about the strong sustainability potential of these different forms of value, and perhaps the greatest potential to create strong sustainability is, again, in generating external value and thinking about externalities and what do those mean. So I want to work through two broad examples that are coming from the use of petroleum resources because this is deeply integrated with climate change. Um, there's oil extraction and what's known as the resource curse, or in some, some terminology, the paradox of plenty. And that is that countries with an abundance of natural resources, fossil fuels, minerals, tend to have less economic growth, less democracy, and worse development outcomes than countries with fewer natural resources. And this is a paradox because you would expect that resource-rich countries would be able to stabilize and take advantage of the wealth that they generate. So what I do with my typology is I argue that part of what's going on in the paradox of plenty or the resource curse is that capital is not that is not created and embedded in place cannot foster a sustainable economy. In effect, what this means is that capital is the means through which resources create value in conjunction with social environmental systems in space and time. In other words, value has to be oops, created here in order to have a meaningful impact. So the resource curse particularly occurs with highly liquid assets. It's the mobilization of petroleum. It's the transformation of a raw resource into a liquid asset, and particularly in, in time, a financially liquid asset that draws the financial resource out of the region in which it's created. So I'm just going to work through two quick cases. Um, one is where I'm doing work in the Gulf of Mexico and the Gulf of Mexico oil fields. We don't traditionally think about the United States as a place with a resource curse, but I think this is a really nice statewide example. So I've been doing work in southern Louisiana. And in the 1920s, oil emerged on the back of other extractive industries like timber, furs, rice, salt. Extractive because the resource isn't consumed locally, it's extracted and exported for external consumption. Um, wetland leases allowed companies to build massive networks of canals, roads, platforms, and wells. That's a kind of rentier economy where they were generating rent off of the production of the land. And it's estimated that the Gulf has a third of crude oil and 40% of its refining capacity. Louisiana in particular, I found this graphic online which shows all of the wells in green and red, oil and gas wells, and then all of the miles of pipeline extending off coast, 33,000 miles of pipeline, generating $70 billion in annual revenue. Um, but the majority of that capital is extracted and abstracted from its source of origin. So the consequence for Louisiana some are environmental. For example, the 2010 Deepwater Horizon spill, which had 5 million barrels released into the Gulf, affecting 35% of the coast. 
By 1970, oil was providing 40% of state revenues, yet Louisiana's at the bottom of human development indexes. And this persists till today. You can see this graphic of poverty rates in the United States, with Louisiana having among the highest poverty rates across the United States. Um, between 1937 and 1977, 20,000 wells were drilled. These are refineries and petrochemical industries uh, that created this advanced complex, which you see up here, which is called Cancer Alley, because of the, the extremely high rates of cancer uh, around this industrial complex and in the region. And then there's also the ecological catastrophe that's unfolding today with the extraction of the petroleum resources leading to subsidence of the land and then for the shipping of the um, petroleum resources up and down the Mississippi, Mississippi River, the divergence of sediment outside of the delta, which is leading to marsh loss. So you see this kind of proje projection from the Louisiana Coastal Master Plan with all of the, the um, areas highlighted in red as the predicted areas that will be under seawater by 2050 with estimations of 28,000 homes that will have to be moved. And so the causes of this, as I said, you know, canal dredging for oil and gas drilling, of course, sea level rise. And indirectly, I think this is also part of the paradox. It's the petroleum ex exploration and extraction to begin with, which is, again, very tightly integrated with climate change. So this is just a, a series of images that's also showing that impact of the dredging, um, the dredging and also the impact of the levee system that diverts the sediment flow. So you can see the difference in these two regions, which are just neighbors separated, the Mississippi River Delta and Atchafalaya River Delta, which still has sedimentation flow and still has a very healthy and vibrant marsh. And then the Mississippi River Delta Basin, which is very rapidly uh, eroding into, into the sea. I want to contrast this very briefly with the Norwegian oil experience. I think Norway is, is maybe one of the gold standards of how to manage petroleum resources. Uh, because what they've done with their resources is generated a government pension fund global worth $930 billion. And it's governed in two ways by Norge's bank investment managers, so has a very strenuous economic management. And I'll talk about some of the conditions of that economic management. It's about localizing the value and sustaining its growth in time. And then also a council of ethics that looks very carefully into divestment issues and into where, ironically, the petroleum reserve is, in, is invested, in, or sorry, the petroleum fund, the pension fund, is invested and in how it's used. But what they've done critically, I think, and what other countries or other regions could learn to do is build a dual economy so petroleum core products and petroleum industry supplies are also a second major industry in Norway. And this generates employment, workplaces, and highly skilled industries. And then they also couple the finance and the capital that they generate from petroleum reserves into sustainable green domestic industries, fisheries, forestry, renewable energy. So on the policy side, the fund works to slow and localize and diversify the petroleum value. The fund's invested primarily outside of Norway to protect exports. It also has a very low annual withdrawal rate of 4% to avoid hyperinflation. And then government industry cooperation is cultural and historical. There's an argument that fisheries, 90% of the stocks in Norway share borders with neighbors, so they have strong experience in learning how to cooperate and how to build policies that work well across industries. And then they also diversify their industries. Forestry, for example, has a range of different things, not just timber, but a range of product products that are generated from it. And finally, policy is built on scientific evidence of the sustainability of the ecosystem as a whole, looking very carefully at what kinds of activities the resources can generate. Some would argue, though, and there still is this concern that it's at best weak sustainability, because in the end, it's a petroleum industry, right? So we would probably be better taking a leaf from Michael Bloomberg's book and divesting or trying to get rid of all of our coal production um, altogether and trying to find a different kind of technology or energy uh, source that the Norwegians could invest in. So I just want to say in conclusion about the economic pathways to sustainability. Sustainability is systemic. It's not just about the quantity of value that's produced, and I think this is critical. It's the way in which value is generated. 
Um, and then the spatial and temporal connections to a host of indicators, social and environmental well-being, have to be carefully considered before we undertake new technological design or even think about the way in which we operate our economies. And finally, there's a long-term time horizon. We have to think not just about quarterly returns, not just about our yearly product. We have to think at the scale of generations. We have to think about decades or hundreds of years into the future so that the benefits we produce are both local as well as global. Thank you. So happy to take any questions. Thanks for joining us. And for more information on how to connect with the MIT Alumni Association, please visit our website.